All right, so <clears throat> this video is about Augustine, uh, St. Augustine, who is uh, a very important Catholic uh, figure, uh, part of the ancient Catholic tradition, uh, wrote in the early centuries of the church, um, wrote it from Africa. Uh, he was a Northern African thinker, and he was on the edge of the Roman Empire when the Roman Empire was collapsing. So he saw the disintegration of the world that he knew, of the order that he knew, and so he's a very kind of interesting socio-political figure as well as religious figure. But we're going to discuss him in this class uh, as regards free will. So free will, uh, he believed that we had uh, and that free will gave us the power uh, to choose good over evil. He believes it was something that was implanted in human beings by God and um, it was a gift from God. Uh, so he doesn't believe in determinism. He doesn't believe our actions are fated to occur. But he does have a complex view of freedom that uh, isn't quite, it's certainly not a Sartrean kind of absolute freedom by any means whatsoever. He essentially thinks that we can lose our freedom. Now, first, you know, I'll talk about uh, the evidence or the argument that he gives for our freedom. Uh, then I'll talk about the consequences of sin. Uh, which eventually leads to a loss of freedom and um, what that loss of freedom means as well as for Augustine the only way to regain that freedom uh, is not through an act of will but ultimately the grace of God so again it's, it's a complex uh, image a complex uh, portrait that he offers so Augustine uh, we have free will uh, he believes we can choose good over evil or human beings have been granted that gift at least in our original state why uh, what evidence does he, he offer for this? Well, he gives this kind of interesting, some might say antiquated argument, about human beings having control over animals. Um, and he wonders, how is that possible, given that animals, or at least many animals, are physically stronger than human beings? If you were to get in a fight with a bear, you would lose. Uh, you know, or a tiger, or a lion, or something like that, or an elephant. I mean, there are a horse, there are many, many animals that are physically superior to human beings in many ways. Speed, strength, eyesight, sensation, um, you know, the ability to, to, to move in different ways, the ability to fly, for example. So you have these animals that are physically superior, yet human beings are undoubtedly in control. Human beings uh, have in a certain sense, rule the world, transform the world. Uh, human beings can use animals to accomplish their will. And while certainly it is always the case that an animal could attack and could destroy an individual human, we as human beings, as a, as a species, uh, are dominant over animals. And how could that be if they, again, are superior physically? And uh, for Augustine, well... Human beings have the capacity to reason. Human beings have the capacity to rule over the physical and rule over the instinctual and rule over that which is driven by desire, uh, or again, for animals, by instinct. And the significance of this is that human beings possess something superior to the physical. If we were just brute matter, if we were just kind of driven by instincts or desire, well then we would be part of the animal kingdom and given our relative physical weakness we would be dominated uh, in that kingdom or we'd have to find some other way to survive. But human beings uh, have the ability to think, have the ability to reason, have the ability to order our desires towards a rational end. And that allows us to control this physical world that in a pure physical terms is superior to us, is stronger than us, should defeat us. But this superior element within us, uh, which Augustine is going to um, equate or uh, align with the divine, with God, is that reason. And our ability to freely choose to act and to follow reason. That's where our free choice really lies. To follow reason, to choose reason, and by choosing reason we order our desires. It's a kind of platonic argument uh, in many ways. Um, now, uh, for Augustine, it is not simply that we have the superior elements. Uh, for Augustine, this is ordered by God. And by God wants the superior, the intellectual, 
the spiritual, to rule over the physical. That's the proper order of the universe. And so it is proper that human beings not only can, but do rule over the physical and the animal world. Now, ruling over doesn't mean doing whatever we want with it. It means ultimately, for Augustine, being caretakers, being shepherds uh, of creation. Um, now, why do we have this? What is the point? Well, for human beings, ultimately, we're designed to worship and to love God. And that is what we are meant to be. Creatures that worship and understand, at least in some small level, uh, the superior element of the universe, the spiritual element of the universe, which is God. And it is proper, it is just, that the superior rules over, controls that which is inferior. It's just a basic principle of justice. The higher should control the lower. And so, while we should be controlled in a certain sense, follow God, God also allows us to control the physical. Um, but when we don't, when we don't elevate the spiritual and intellectual over the physical, and when we follow the physical, when essentially we become, uh, follow our desires, follow our lusts for uh, physical things, that for Augustine is sin. Lust is sin. Lust is love of that which can be lost against one's will. And essentially that means love of the physical. Now, you know, you might say, well, there's plenty of things in the physical universe that I love, and, um, you know, I love other physical beings. But what uh, Augustine is going to say is that what he means by love is that you make it sort of your God. You make it the most important thing in your life. So when we make physical things, temporal things, I should even broaden the term, the most important thing in the world, then we're involved in a form of idolatry. When we make power or money or uh, uh, sexual desire or um, positions, rewards, recognitions, material uh, accumulation of wealth in terms of houses, in terms of properties, in terms of you know cars, anything like that. When that becomes our driving force, when that becomes what we love, and by love again it means making that most important in our life, that's when we are in sin because we have disordered the universe. And for Augustine, the source uh, or the result, the consequence of sin, is that we are miserable. We are unhappy beings. And we're unhappy because we are following an order that is not proper to us. And for Augustine, he makes this fascinating argument where he essentially says, look, sin is its own punishment. You don't have to wait to go to the afterlife. You don't have to wait for hell to get punished for, for being a sinner. You get it right now in this world. And you get it because those that sin, those that love which can, that which can be lost against one's will, uh, are faced with all the consequences of sin. And that is jealousy, anxiety, um, insatiable desire. Nothing is ever enough. You always want more. I mean, think about it. If you love recognition, you know, you may be recognized for some accomplishment, but that fades very, very quickly, and then you want something else. You want something more, and you need it. And if you're not getting that, you're going to be anxious. Well, when am I going to be recognized again? Am I a failure? Am I not worthy? Um, and then you also become jealous because you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, why does this person receive all the attention? Why does this person get all the praise? Why does this person have a bigger house than me? And, you know, let's say you're successful, you get a nice job, you get a big house, and then you want something more. You want a bigger house, and you worry, well, is my house is up to date? Is my house have all the perks, all the, the bells and whistles uh, of someone else? You know, and if I don't have that, am I falling behind? It is constant. It is exhausting. Sin, the life of sin, the life of loving, that which can be lost against one's will, uh, is an emotionally, spiritually uh, unhappy, unsettled, unfulfilling type of existence. And that's the result of sin. Um, whereas the person who speaks, seeks spiritual things, relationship with God, you know, the uh, ability, the de desire, and the habit of virtue, relationships with others in terms of who they are as a person, that's where you can get security, tranquility, peace. In a certain sense, remember, I mean, his world was falling apart, going back to the socio-political Augustine. 
the Roman Empire was falling and he was on the edge of it and he was seeing his society collapse. So you, one could, could see why this notion of sin and this notion of happiness and unhappiness would be particularly pertinent for somebody like Augustine. Now, um, so the life of sin is unhappy, the life of spirit, of intellect, of prayer is one of happiness. And so if we weren't able to choose the higher life over the lower, if we were inevitably driven by lust and we had no control over it, well then for Augustine, this would be a fundamentally improperly ordered creation. And so this is the part of the second argument for freedom. The first argument being the idea the, that we rule over animals and how could that be? The second being that if we were destined to a life of sin and therefore misery, um, then God would have made creation poorly. God would not have been a, a creator who would seem to love and want the best for his creatures. But since this is incompatible with Augustine's notion of God and the goodness of God, um, it must be the case that we have the choice and have the ability to follow that which is higher, and ultimately we have the ability and the choice to live a life that is happy. So you got this. You got this, uh, this sense of freedom, this theological sense of freedom, this kind of a, a, um, observational sense of freedom. Um, but it does seem like certain people are driven by sin. It does seem to be like people, um, you know, what is most important in their life is that which can be lost against their will and love of power or love of money or love of uh, women or love of men or love of recognition or love of material possession. It seems like for some people they can't live without it. It doesn't seem like they have a free choice. And essentially what Augustine is going to offer here is an account of a loss of freedom that is very much similar to addiction. The addict also cannot choose that which is better for him or her. You know, someone addicted to drugs, someone addicted to substances, you see that very clearly. They don't have the ability, they don't have the power, even though they know in their hearts that, you know, this is not a life they want to live. They can't help themselves. And Augustine would agree. These people, in a very real sense, have lost their freedom. But it's not because they were not granted freedom by God. It's because they chose the lower over the higher. And they chose it again and again and again. Over a period of time, those choices become habit. And over a longer period of time, that habit becomes a kind of a chain, inevitability. We become prisoners of our habits. Those habits, in a certain sense, abolish our free will because they become something that we automatically, that we feel like we need to do. And it's in this state where one has lost one's freedom through one's own free choices that human beings find themselves in very, very often. There's very few of us that have given up lusting, that have given up uh, love of the lower over the higher. And so many of us, most of us, are in fact slaves to our desires, slaves to our lust. Um, and we can't help it doing otherwise. We can't help it seeking recognition or attention or power or money uh, or control. But again, it's not because we didn't have the freedom to choose otherwise. It's because we've made bad choices over an extended period of time and, and eventually those desires become stronger and more powerful. Our ability to reason is lessened and our ability to choose the rational becomes non-existent. Now, for Augustine, what's the way out? Especially if most of us are these kind of addicts. Well, the way out is ultimately God. And this is a, a longer story that's not going to be told in this uh, video or, or in this reading. But for Augustine, the grace of God is that which we require to ultimately regain freedom. We need the help of another. We need the help of the supreme ruler of the universe in order to regain our freedom. But again, it's because we have lost it. Now the picture becomes even more complicated if you were to talk about original sin, and you know many scholars have debated whether Augustine's early theory of freedom uh, on the free choice of the will, which this reading is essentially based on, is compatible with later 
uh, understandings of freedom and original sin, where it seems like I as an individual didn't lose my freedom, but we are born into a race that is marked by original sin, and so therefore we can't help it. We are already, in some sense, born addicts. And in that case, does, do we really have freedom of choice? I mean, ultimately, again, Augustine's going to say, it, we have to then rely on God. The grace of God is what will ultimately set us free. So there is Augustine. You know, he gives some arguments for freedom. He gives an argument for why sin is its own punishment, is its own miserable life. And he gives an argument as to how we can eventually lose our freedom. And, um, you know, this is an account of freedom that is very theological, but it's also, I think, very relevant and something that many of us could relate to.